The first month of my 90 day journey, I was doing lazy keto. What's up, it's your girl from BeFit. If you don't know who I am, I'm an online weight loss coach who's dedicated to calling out all the BS in the fitness industry and providing you with accurate fitness, nutrition, and weight loss information. Today we are doing a reaction video to Blogilates video about how she lost 17 and a half pounds in 90 days. And normally when I do reaction videos, I haven't watched any of the other creators' content. I don't know very much if anything about the person. But with Blog Lotties, I do have a little bit of background info, although not a ton. So I want to start the video by sharing my overall impressions and opinions about Blog Lotties, and then we'll get into this video specifically where she's talking about weight loss, which is my area of expertise. But first, before we jump into all of that, this video is sponsored by Built Bar making sure they're the right way because last time they were upside down. <laughs> you guys have probably heard from me before if you've been watching the channel for a while that Bill Bar is my favorite protein bar of all time. They're coated in real chocolate on the outside and the inside is this like a incredible like nougaty, I don't even know how to describe it, like texture. I'll put a clip up here. So the taste is a huge reason why I love them also because they have tons of flavors. Like I don't know any other protein bar brand that has as many flavors as Built Bar. So like you are guaranteed to find one that you love. And the last thing that I love about them, which is equally important as the taste, in my opinion, is the amount of calories and protein in these bars. Because I had previous favorites before I tried Built Bar, but I was always like, okay, this is the protein bar that I like that's like high in carbs and calories and like has a decent amount of protein. I'm like, this is the one, it has like less protein and it's higher in fat, but it's like, you know, the like I had so many like options depending on what I needed, but I feel like this one just like checks off everything that I need from a protein bar. Like these two flavors, for example, are 130 calories and 17 grams of protein each, which is pretty spot on and incredible compared to my previous favorites that were more calories and less protein. So if you'd like to try out Bill Bar or if you need to restock, you can use this discount code and use the link in the description to get 15% off your order. Thanks Bill for sponsoring this video. All right, so giving the disclaimer before I give my overall opinion of Blog Lotties is that I really don't know a ton about her. I just know more than the other people I usually react to in these reaction videos. My main introduction to Blog Lotties was actually on TikTok and I didn't join TikTok until last year. And I know Blog Lotties has been around for a while. So that's the lens that I've been able to view Blog Lotties from is the TikTok space. And in my reacting to like TikTok workout videos, I did react to one of Blogilates videos and I didn't have a lot of great things to say because it felt very like clickbaity in a way that wasn't clear enough that it was clickbait, that it was gonna ultimately mislead the viewers. So I think the caption was like, how to get long lean legs. And I was like, you obviously can't increase the length of your legs and there's no workout that's like gonna lean out your legs by like losing fat because spot reduction isn't a thing. I just get very like spot reduction vibes playing with words in a way that could definitely mislead her audience, which I don't love. Same with Chloe Ting. That's my problem with Chloe Ting is that we're walking this tightrope of clickbait where some people understand that it's clickbait, but I think some people don't. And some people think that's not a big deal. I personally don't believe it's worth the risk to mislead your audience just to get more views because that's usually what those types of titles and thumbnails and whatever else do. But I'm not gonna comment on that. I understand why they do that. Social media is their job. It's my job. The more people that you can reach, by playing to the algorithm and whatever else, the more people you can ultimately help and the better that you do as a business owner or influencer or whatever you wanna call it. So that's just all I'm gonna say about that. The other thing that I've noticed with Blogilates is a lot of like, especially on TikTok, a lot of the bro-y like bodybuilder people. And this is where I think people are unfairly criticizing Cassie. So they'll come at her videos where she's talking about Pilates moves. She's a Pilates instructor. That's her thing. That's her space. That's what she does. And they'll say like, oh, that workout isn't gonna build like muscle like as effectively as weightlifting. And like, that might be true, but like not everybody is out there trying to be a bodybuilder. And Pilates is something that I recommend to my students in my course and even to my one-on-one -on -one clients when I had them. Sidebar, if you didn't know, I stopped working with one-on-one -on -one clients to put everything I have into this course that I have. If you're interested in learning about it, you can use the link pinned in the comments. I would absolutely love to have you. But I came from like the 
bro -y bodybuilder space. I've done two bodybuilding competitions. Weight training is my personal preference in terms of exercise. And I used to have those beliefs, but I don't anymore. I think that Pilates is a great form of exercise. I do put it in the resistance training category, just like I do with weight training. It's all about finding exercise that you personally love to do and that you enjoy. And just because Pilates isn't gonna build as much muscle as effectively as weight training, that doesn't mean it's not a valid form of exercise. So I do think she gets some uh, like unfair criticism in that department. So those are my initial thoughts. I feel like I already talked too much about that. Let's just get straight into her video. Hey guys, Cassie here. I'd first like to start off this video by very clearly stating that if you are triggered by numbers and transformation photos, please, don't watch this video. I'd also like to very, very clearly state that no, I do not have an eating disorder. No, I don't have a body image disorder. No, I don't hate myself. No, this journey was not for you. It was for me. Pretty intense disclaimer there in the beginning, but I fully understand why she is giving this disclaimer. I just saw a TikTok literally, I think yesterday, of this girl saying like, if you use my fitness pal and track your calories, you have an eating disorder. And I was like, we're taking this a little too far. Is it true that people, some people who utilize calorie tracking and apps like MyFitnessPal are doing so because they have a disordered relationship with food and it can exacerbate that? Totally. Does that mean that everybody who uses MyFitnessPal has an ED? Absolutely not. I actually made this video of like, should you count calories or not? And it might be a good one to check out if you're considering whether or not it's the right fit for you, because I do think that it's not the right fit for everybody, but it can be a super great tool for those that it will benefit. And overall right now, it feels kind of uncomfortable to be in the weight loss space, because if you share about your own weight loss journey, or if you share about weight loss, people are going to extremes and assuming that you're wanting to change your body because you hate it, you're wanting to change your body because you're fat phobic. If you want to change your body when you look a certain way, that means anybody who's like bigger than you also needs to lose weight. Like there's a lot of beliefs that people are assigning to people who are sharing their journeys or sharing information about weight loss. And I've personally felt really confused, I guess might be a word, frustrated troubled. I don't know. It's it's a weird place to be for sure. So I understand why she gave this disclaimer, but it also makes me so interested to see exactly what she's going to do that people are going to think she has an ED or hates herself. At the end of this past summer, Sam and I had just finished a three day retreat and on our way back to the airport, I broke down and just started crying out of nowhere. As Sam was driving, all this emotion overpowered my body and I became overwhelmed with sadness when I realized that I was not living the life that I wanted. You see, being in the public eye for over 10 years now, I began to say less and less for fear of being judged. Back when I started Blogilates in 2009, I was pretty much blogging seven days a week. But as Blogilates got bigger and bigger, I became more and more safe and less and less vocal because I was afraid of making people unhappy. And I ended up molding myself into this vanilla cupcake whose goal was to offend no one. In doing so, I lost my identity. I have nowhere near the audience that Cassie has, but I very much identify with this. And I understand that it might be kind of cringy for like people with an audience to complain about these sorts of things because we literally picked this kind of job, like nobody forced us into this. But I also have taken a step back from posting more controversial content because I could not handle the hate that would come with that. And I still have those opinions, absolutely. But it got to the point where like all the hate was really impacting my mental health. And somebody commented recently, like, because my, in my intro, I say I call out all the BS in the fitness industry and they're like you really don't like you don't call out the BS you don't really call people out who need to be called out and I was like this is how I can help you guys right now this is how I can share value to you all and if it's not as like intense or confrontational as you were wishing it was I apologize but I don't have that in me right now as I improve my mental health I hope to get back to sharing content like that because I do think it's really valuable for you guys to hear the no fluff straight up like no BS information your girl just needed a break and and on August 16th, I decided it was time to make a big change. I told Sam that I wanted to go on a 90 day journey to get in the best shape of my life physically and mentally. So after reviewing the entire plan with Sam, I made my decision to announce my 90 day journey publicly on August 16th. You know, I kind of knew I was going to get some backlash, but I was not prepared for how much backlash I was going to get. Now that I've had three months to think about it, Here's my take on why my 90 day journey was received with so much 
negativity. You see, it's weird when you start out teaching Pilates on YouTube with the pure goal of just teaching Pilates and then people start making comments about how fat you are. Then when the media brands you as a body positive influencer because you're so brave for teaching Pilates about a six pack, all of a sudden you become a leader of a movement you didn't ask to become a part of. I didn't know any of that. That's horrific that people labeled her a body positive person because she didn't have the stereotypical like six pack that most fitness instructors have. That is so messed up. I mean, she said she started 10 years ago and we were in a very different space as a society related to like health and fitness and nutrition and weight loss and body image and all the, that stuff, but that's bad. Shame on us for that. But she said she became a leader of a movement that she like didn't even mean to be a part of. And I, on a very minuscule level, again, because Cassie's audience is like so much bigger, but I recently had somebody tell me that I am a body positive YouTuber. And they made that comment in relation to my like, I gained weight and how I plan to lose it video. And they were like, that video made me feel kind of bad because I am like bigger than you. And if you feel like you need to lose weight, then what does that say about me? And at first I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I ever made you feel that way. But then I was like, wait a minute. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, just because somebody makes the decision that weight loss might be right for them. And if you actually watch that video fully, I mention I feel like quite a bit that like weight loss isn't the primary like goal. Although I think it's an inevitable outcome of my strategy to get back on track with my mental health, my physical health and all of that stuff. But just because I decide that weight loss is right for me doesn't mean that if you are bigger than me that you also need to lose weight. I know it's so easy to compare yourself and I get how you would have those thoughts, but you gotta like take responsibility for how you feel about yourself and your own beliefs. And I was very confused at being called a body positive YouTuber because I've never claimed that. And I've never t really talked about body positivity. I think in the Dr. Mike like fat phobic video, somebody in the comments actually section actually got really mad at me and said they were unfollowing me because I am a part of like the fat liberation movement and like all of this stuff that I've absolutely never claimed to be. I'm also not saying I'm not a part of that. Like I just don't know enough about that. And I don't like to label myself at all because I think there's so much gray area that putting a label on yourself, it's just like Im impossible for me. Like I just know how nuanced all this stuff is and there's no label out there. But basically in that Dr. Mike video, I was like, I think think that like society as a whole and is very over critical of people's bodies, especially women's bodies. And that in order to achieve health, we don't necessarily have to look like people think we have to look in order to be healthy. And I guess that was enough to la put a label on me. I don't even personally identify with body positivity. The movement was not created for somebody like me. And I personally just don't subscribe to the belief that my fa my, my thaws, my flaws are beautiful. Like that doesn't work for me. It doesn't do it for me. So for me personally, and what I teach in my course is body neutrality. I have had so much like liberation by subscribing to the belief that my body, like the way it looks is one of the least important things about me. But this video is not about me. Let's get back to Cassie's weight loss journey. First off, I literally cannot believe 90 days flew by so fast. Like what? With every day that passed, I felt more and more like myself again. I shed away the old Cassie who was afraid of other people's opinion of her and grew into a more confident, happier, stronger, and sassier version of myself. Dance is also like weightlifting, actually. I was gonna say it's weightlifting first and then dancing, but it might be a tie. I love a good dance class. I always get so excited when I see people dancing for exercise, cause it's so fun. I wanna make it clear that I didn't go on this journey because I hated my body. I went on this journey because I loved my body so much that I wanted to dedicate time towards improving myself mentally and physically. That's it, preach, nothing to add, carry on. I wrote that my physical goals were to reach 120 pounds and an athlete level body fat percentage of 20%. Alison, I think it's fine to have a goal weight, even a body fat percentage weight, but I think it's easy for people to get too sucked up into those numerical goals that they forget about why they're doing it in the first place. This is something I go over in depth with my course students. I've just seen so many people, especially when I do consultations like one-on-one -on -one with women, where they're like, I'm so close to my goal weight, but I can't get the rest of this weight off. Like whether it's two pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever. 
And when I ask why they wanna lose weight in the first place, they're like, oh, I just wanna feel better, I wanna feel more confident, like blah, blah, blah. You don't have to be the weight that you have as your goal weight to accomplish those things. And so we get so hyper-focused on the scale number that we forget that there are also other ways to achieve those whys and that those whys don't have an exact number on the scale that it's required. And as far as body fat percentage goes, I used to be really into that when I was into bodybuilding because like you get super lean and it's so fun to like brag about how low your body fat percentage is. But even at that point, I wasn't tracking my body fat percentage regularly and I have never thought about it again since then. Like mostly because it's so difficult to get an accurate measurement of that number that I think it's kind of useless to try to track it. So I feel like we could do without the body fat percentage goal. And I'll be interested to see how, like what method she's going about tracking it. In general, I was working out six days a week with one day of rest. It was a combination of running at the beginning, Pilates, hit, hit 28, dancing, and weightlifting. So workout wise, my routine didn't really change that much from before the 90 day journey and into the 90 day journey. The only thing that changed was I started taking dance classes. And you guys, I have to tell you, it's been the best thing ever because I just feel so happy. I discovered this class called Heels. And if you haven't seen me do it yet, go check out my Instagram. But basically you're wearing high heels and you're dancing. You're being super sexy and sometimes even raunchy. But oh my gosh, it is such a confidence booster. And the community of women in the class, oh my gosh, everyone is so positive and supported. I just walk out of class feeling like a million bucks and I literally can't wait to take the class every Thursday night. Heels classes were my all-time favorite too. I used to go sometimes three times a week when I was living in Phoenix. Now that I'm in Flagstaff, there are no classes here anymore and I miss it so much. But I agree with everything she just said. It's so empowering. It's so fun. I actually really wanted to go. I asked a friend of mine to go with me to my first class and she was like, mm, I don't really want to go. Like I've heard bad things about that instructor and I just was like, okay, I'm like, Lena, you gotta do it yourself. You can't rely on your friends to go with you. If this is something you wanna do, you just gotta do it. My hands were shaking on the steering wheel while I was driving to this dance class because I'd never been to the studio, I'd never been to that teacher before, and I've never done heels before. I get very nervous trying new things. It was like so much fun and I was addicted ever since. I met so many amazing friends. I even ended up performing in a choreography showcase for that particular teacher like in Phoenix in front of a crowd. But if you've ever, if you've ever considered doing a heels dance class, I'm telling you, just try it. It's the greatest thing ever. Now, let's talk food. The first month of my 90 day journey, I was doing lazy keto. It was going so good. I don't know what lazy keto is, but I'm not a fan of keto. If you wanna hear me talk about like different diets and exercise strategies in more depth and like I rank them and talk about the pros and cons, you can watch this video that I did. But keto is just not required for fat loss. And if you, ha if you have trouble losing fat, keto is not gonna be that magic thing that helps you. Listen, if you genuinely don't enjoy carbohydrates, fine do keto. I am okay with any diet as long as you genuinely enjoy it, but I feel like for the majority of people, keto is not the right move. If you didn't know, keto was originally developed to help for people with epilepsy. It was a medical diet, which was also done under supervision of medical professionals. There are risks involved to doing keto. I am a little biased because I cannot imagine life without carbs. So that's usually the result of my very, very strong reaction when I hear people say that they're doing keto. But why? Why? I'm sure she's gonna explain why. Let's see if she says why. So high fat, low carb, moderate protein. I wasn't calculating my macros or calories, but I was very conscious of my carb levels being pretty low and my fat levels being pretty high in comparison to each other. So it sounds like lazy keto is just low carb because if you're really not being careful enough with your carbs or tracking them, you are very likely not gonna be in ketosis and then you're not actually doing the keto diet. So to me, lazy keto is just pointless because the whole claim of keto is that you're in ketosis and if your carbs aren't low enough, you're not gonna be in ketosis. So what's the point? I just don't get it. I allowed myself to eat cheese, which I normally don't because I'm lactose intolerant. So it was actually kind of fun going keto in the beginning. You ate cheese because on keto you can eat cheese but you're lactose intolerant? Like, I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm gonna stop interrupting. Then around one and a half months in, I saw a stagnation, so I switched to a more strict form of keto, which excluded dairy and nuts. So basically it wasn't as fun. But at the start of month two, I was getting some terrible headaches. 
I was constantly thirsty and super fatigued. I realized that these were the symptoms of something called the keto flu. Eventually it passed, but then it came back again and even worse. So I consulted a keto expert who told me that the reason why I was getting these symptoms was because I wasn't having enough salt and I wasn't taking the right supplements. Okay. It's getting worse. I would not say that eliminating like nuts and cheese is a more strict form of keto. It's just like you're eliminating cheese and nuts. So it's like maybe a more restrictive form of keto or I don't know, to me, a stricter keto would be actually tracking your carbohydrate intake. Keto flu, my understanding, now hold on, okay? Don't have any keto people come into my comment section. I know that at least part of the reason people go through a keto flu is because their body is transitioning from using carbohydrates as their primary source of energy throughout the day to fat as their primary source of energy throughout the day, which makes sense that she's going through the keto flu over and over because she's not tracking her carbohydrates. So she might be coming in and out in keto to the point where she can never get past the keto flu and feel better. I don't think sodium and supplements <laughs> supplements are going to fix it. And just as a disclaimer, if you're doing a diet, whether it's keto or something else, and it's not working and you think that supplements are the answer, I can guarantee that supplements are not the answer. I bet the supplement is going to be ketones. I bet it's going to be ketones. Please don't buy ketones. It's just not not going to do anything for you. Per his advice, I began to eat much saltier foods and I started taking some MCT oil powders, probiotic powders, and exogenous ketones. It definitely helped cure my keto flu. However, after a couple weeks of doing all of that, I came to the conclusion that if keto required me to take all of these extra things to feel balanced, then keto probably wasn't the right thing for me. I agree. I'm so glad that she came to this conclusion. Not just because I'm like annoying, I might be annoying, but because like that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound fun. My goal for everybody who's losing weight is to figure out the most enjoyable way to accomplish that. And yeah, even if keto is working for you, if you're not having a good time, if you're having to take all these extra supplements, and just taking up so much of your energy in your life and you're sucking the joy, please switch to a different diet. You know what? That That is the number one reason why I hate keto so much because I know that the majority of people who are on it are suffering because they don't actually want to do it. They just think it's a diet that's going to be better than or work differently than something they've tried in the past. Okay, so she's done with keto. Final things that I just want to say about keto. Is it required for weight loss? No. Is there anything special about it for weight loss? No. Should you try it? Probably not. Not. If you actually think you're going to enjoy a diet without carbs in it, you do you. Are there risks involved? Yes. Please do your research if you're going to try keto. Also for your enjoyment matters. I promise there's a diet out there that you can enjoy and lose weight. I promise. So around mid month two, I began to incorporate more fruits and I began lowering my fat intake. My staples were berries and kombucha. Oh my gosh, I love kombucha so much. Oh, and there was this whole phase of me eating pumpkin pie hummus. You guys can get it at Costco, it's so good. I tried the pumpkin pie hummus, didn't like it. I'm not really a pumpkin kind of gal, but the dark chocolate hummus, so incredible. Dessert hummus, I know it sounds really diet culture-y, I acknowledge that, but it's genuinely good. I would love to see her eating more carbs, but it is a good idea when you're transitioning out of keto to increase your carbohydrates more slowly rather than just going straight back to what you were doing before. I felt so much better and so much more balanced. Plus there are no more headaches, no more fatigue, and no more dry mouth. But then things started to stagnate again. So I decided to get honest with myself. It was time to calorie count. I didn't want to do this originally, but I suspected that I was overeating. Okay, so my thoughts here are that it's fine that she decided to calorie count, but just because you hit a wall or you stagnate does not mean that you automatically need to count your calories in order to get results. The thing with her was that she had a 90 day timeline to reach her goals. So it was a little bit more urgent that she start getting results again, which is also why I don't love putting timelines on things or having goal weights like I mentioned before. But in my course, it's called Tried and True Weight Loss For You. Again, if you're interested, there's a link pinned in the comments and the description, which will give you more information about it. But my students can choose to calorie track and then eventually transition into mindful eating or just do mindful eating. So I think that she could have used a mindful eating approach and still got results, but it just probably wouldn't have been within the time frame that she set for herself. It's 
fine, everything's fine that she decided to do it like that. But I just don't want anyone watching to think that like that's the automatic next step if you stagnate with your diet and nothing else is working, that it's like time to count my calories. So by the end of month two and into month three, I was tracking all of my food in my fitness pal. Originally, I was dreading the fact that I have to do this, but actually, I ended up weirdly enjoying it. Tracking my food so meticulously relieved a lot of stress from my life. Before tracking, I was always calculating in my head what I was consuming. I don't think that you should be calculating in your head. I don't think that that's necessarily healthy or a good idea. It sounds really stressful, but I agree with her because when I was counting my calories or counting my macros or whatever I was doing at the time, I did it for a while. I did it for my last, my second bodybuilding competition and I enjoyed it too. It was really empowering for me to get to see how much like fun I get to have with my diet, but like still get incredible results. Like I stepped on stage for this competition where I looked the best I ever have and I ate spaghetti and ice cream and cookies most days. And so it made me feel very free from food. I acknowledge again that calorie tracking is not gonna do that for some people, but I had the same experience that she did. So, did it work? Well, here's a graph of my weight change every day over the past 90 days. Some people may call daily weighing obsessive, but I call it consistent data point collection. As you can see, my 90 day journey was not a straight line down. I am a huge fan of weighing daily if that's a healthy behavior for you, or at least a neutral behavior for you, because yes, it is just data collection. I love having, or used to love having clients try at least just one week of weighing every day so that they could see how normal fluctuations are to realize that like one change on the scale is not the end of the world and isn't enough information for you to decide whether or not you're losing fat or gaining fat. I do talk about like scale best practices in this video if you're interested in checking it out and figuring out how to maybe have a better relationship with the scale, but I'm also a data freak, so I love data. But that's not in like an unhealthy way. I'm like that with everything. My financial planner recently like sent me the spreadsheet of my investment strategy that we came up with and she's like, sorry if it's too spreadsheety. And I was like, I love it. I love spreadsheets. So if you see that like really drastic decrease right off the bat, that's because when you switch from eating a normal amount of carbohydrates to keto, you're losing a lot of water from your body. And this is because for every gram of carbohydrate you're consuming, your body is holding on to a certain amount of water and that's normal and that's healthy. It's not a bad thing. So that initial drop that you see, I think almost everybody is gonna see that when they start keto. It's not body fat, unfortunately, it is just water. And when you go back to eating carbs, you're likely gonna see that weight come back. During this time, I was snacking on nuts and cheeses quite a bit. I had not started calorie tracking yet, but I was consuming a lot of nuts and cheese simply because it was keto friendly and it was super fun. On September 6th, I decided to stop eating so much dairy and that is what helped me push past my first plateau. So that what I'm hearing is I was eating keto, which is like this list of foods that you can eat and then I hit a plateau and then I eliminated some of those foods. Keto foods are very calorie dense. So like cheese and nuts have a lot of calories, although they do also have nutrients, which is great. So that she then eliminated those two things that she just said she was eating frequently because they were yummy and that got her out of her plateau. That just means her calories decreased because she stopped eating those things that she was eating before. It's not because dairy or nuts are particularly bad for you and it's not because doing a stricter keto is some magical thing for weight loss. Right here, you can see my third plateau. Food-wise, there wasn't anything I could really pinpoint to this plateau, but in reading through my fit journal again, it seems that I didn't sleep very much during this time period as we had a huge shoot I was prepping for on October 11th. The plateau was caused by a severe lack of sleep that increased the levels of the stress hormone cortisol in my body, which made me hold on to more fat during this time period. Okay, this is a little tricky because she was calculating her calories that entire time. I don't know if she's actually gonna show us like how many calories she was consuming every day and if that changed at all, but cortisol and stress, and like I think people make out that relationship to be way more simplistic than it actually is. Just because you're stressed doesn't mean that you can't lose body fat but what lack of sleep and stress are gonna do to you is increase inflammation in the body, really intense exercise with not enough recovery can also do this to you, and that's why the scale will be up. If you have a really intense workout and the scale's up the next day, don't stress, your body just needs to recover. But lack of sleep makes you more hungry and more cravy because it messes up your hunger and satiety hormones, leptin and ghrelin, and stress can also 
make you more like, you know, I mean, it depends. Some people get stressed and they don't eat. Some people get stressed and they eat more. So, you know, also depends on your food's relationship with stress and if you use that to cope. But there are a lot of other factors at play besides my cortisol is high, which makes it impossible for me to lose body fat. For those of you who have been reading my blog, you've probably seen these charts that I've been filling out every week for the past 12 and a half weeks. I recorded my weight, body fat percentage, and muscle mass percentage every seven days. That's a beautiful spreadsheet. I love that. If you're somebody who loves spreadsheets, comment down below. Maybe we should start a club. So. Did I make my goals? Body fat wise, my original goal was to get to 20%. Day one, I was at 24.4%. And on day 90, I got to 20.8%. So close. I didn't exactly make it completely into athlete level body fat range. Hey, but that's okay. I like that she's not stressed that she did I get to 20 because I think a lot of people would and that's the problem that I have with these numerical goals. But she didn't mention how she tracked her body fat. I was hoping that she would so we could talk about that. But I think I talk about it in the scale video actually because I tell you guys not to get those body fat scales because they're not worth it. Weight wise, my original goal was to get to 120 pounds. I started out at 136 pounds, which is the heaviest I had ever been. And on my 90th day, I weighed in at 118.6 pounds. This was craziness because I honestly thought I wasn't gonna make my goal. There were so many plateaus and I was traveling and all sorts of crazy stuff. I really just didn't know what was gonna happen. Another huge mistake that I see with people when they're on their weight loss journey is they think when they hit a plateau or life gets crazy, it's just like time to throw in the towel. But this is a perfect example. If you just stick to it and you have faith that what you're doing will eventually get you to your goal, you're gonna get there. Maybe not in the exact time frame that you want just because she hit it in 90 days doesn't mean that you will, but that doesn't mean that you're a failure. You just can't give up when you hit plateaus. They are so normal. I still gotta make a whole video about plateaus. I have such a long list of videos that I gotta make for you guys, but I'll put the plateau one at the top of my to-do list or to film list. From the beginning, I prepped my mind for the possible outcomes so that I wouldn't be disappointed. Obviously, if I made it, great. But if I didn't, I told myself that I'd be okay because the goals were just destinations to walk towards. The treasures weren't waiting for me at the end. They were already here. They were sprinkled throughout the entire journey every day for me to find. That's so cute. I love that. During my 90 day journey, I gave myself grace and space to experiment. I allowed for failure and flexibility. Calorie wise, some days I was over 2000 and other days I stayed around 1300. Flexibility was the key here, you guys. Had I started out saying, I'm gonna do keto for 90 days, I don't think I would have had the results I have today. And if I did, I would have felt completely restricted. This is huge. I agree that flexibility is definitely the key, but the key is also like, having enough awareness to be able to decide that a change needs to be made and then know what changes to make, which is something that I teach in my course. But that's interesting that her calories are kind of all over the place. I like it because for my calorie counter, calorie tracker students, I do recommend that they utilize a range that can actually change depending on like your goals and your flexibility in your life and all of those things. Because I think that needing to hit an exact number, whether it's like your calories, your macros is unnecessarily stressful and not necessary. So I like that she was very flexible when it came to her calorie range. But again, I would love to see like during that stressful time, how her calories changed to see if that had had an impact. I think she said she had another plateau at that point or it was harder for her to let go of some body fat. And it, just from what she's saying, it sounds like the whole purpose of calorie counting was simply observation rather than having a target goal to hit, which I also kind of like. I just wish she talked about it a little bit more. I'm most proud of getting through this 90 day journey on my own terms. You see, the only other two times in my life when I went on an intentional fat loss journey, I was guided by male personal trainers. Now look, I appreciated their guidance and the accountability they gave me to stay on track. However, I did not love the food I ate and I did not truly enjoy my workouts either. Everything was strict and there was no room for flexibility. As much as I enjoyed the progress I was seeing, I wanted it to be over so bad because I couldn't see myself sustaining that lifestyle forever. And that's the thing about this is people have experiences with fat loss that are like that, where they're miserable the whole time. And then when you hear somebody like me say like, oh, you need to lose weight sustainably and slowly lose one pound a week or less than that. They're like, 
thinking maybe I'm just prolonging my misery because that's the way that I have to eat in order to lose weight. But the thing is, when you're going slow and sustainable, you don't need to eat in a drastic way like that. And I love that she like did the dance classes. She was doing Pilates, she was doing weights, she was doing HIIT. Like, she did not put herself in a box in terms of fitness, which I love. So many great points here. The thing I want, to, want you to take from it though is that like there's so many different ways for you to be able to accomplish your goals and it's all about experimenting and finding the way that is most enjoyable in order to get there. In regards to weight versus caloric intake, I noticed that in general, the less calories I consumed, the lower my weight became. This would seem super obvious, but it's necessary to point out since there are a lot of theories out there about starvation mode. Starvation mode is supposed to be your body's natural response to long-term caloric restriction. It's your body responding to reduce calorie intake by reducing caloric expenditure to maintain energy balance and prevent starvation. Technically, it's called adaptive thermogenesis. I've heard people talk about starvation mode and they're not talking about this. Or they are, but like in a more extreme way. So people who claim that starvation mode is a thing, they're like eventually you get to the point where like no matter how little you eat, you can't lose weight, which is not true. Obviously, disclaimer, not ever recommending just eating less and less calories to continue losing weight. But if you decrease your calories continually, you will still lose weight. But the thing is, what she's talking about, adaptive thermogenesis, is what I would call metabolic adaptation, where your metabolism does in fact like decrease in accordance with you just continuing to drop your calories. But it's never gonna get to the point where if you're eating nothing, you aren't losing weight. Because your metabolism cannot get to the point where you're burning zero calories in order to combat the zero calories that you're eating. Again, please do not starve yourself. I'm just giving you the facts. So in my opinion, starvation mode and adaptive thermogenesis or metabolic adaptation are two very different things. Metabolic adaptation is, and this is something that I can talk about in more depth in the plateau video, but it is worth being concerned about. If you eat too few calories for too long, your metabolism will adapt and it, it can absolutely adapt back up but you have to feed it in a way to like convince it to adapt back up. So if you lose weight by just decreasing your calories over and over and over again, your metabolism is gonna get to a point where you have to eat a tiny amount of food in order to maintain those results, which is not healthy and it's not enjoyable. So we do wanna avoid this at all costs. This can absolutely be a reason that somebody is in a plateau, but the answer is not always just decrease your calories more because again, you might dig yourself into this deep hole where you have to eat very little in order to maintain your results. And if you eat any more than that, you gain weight. Anyway, I didn't experience that starvation mode as the lowest I ever went was around 1200 calories. But even so, it was never really that consistently low like that. Yeah, so when she mentioned that her calories ranged between 1300 and 12,000, I initially wanted to be like, you shouldn't eat that low of calories, like that's too low. I generally, as a number, recommend not going below 1400, but as a more specific recommendation, I don't recommend going below your BMR if you can avoid it. But when you saw her calorie thing, and the fact that she said it was ranging between 1300 to 12,000 meant that she wasn't eating consistently at that low of calories. And because I recommend a calorie range for my students, it's sometimes okay to eat like less if that's what your body is telling you. Your body's gonna have varying caloric needs every day. And typically what happens if you eat less one day because you weren't as hungry, the next day you're gonna eat a little bit more. So the problem is when you eat consistently at super low calories. Only wanting to eat 1300 calories one day does not mean that you are you have disordered eating or you know something like that. That's the reason I didn't flag it was because she's not consistently eating that low. And you could see from her calorie chart that it was like, you know, all over the place, which makes sense. Single days don't matter as much as like longer periods of time. So a lot of the time when you're evaluating your results of whether or not you were in a calorie deficit for that week, you would average out your calories over seven days or longer if you wanted to. In regards to weight versus protein percent intake, the more protein I consumed, that's percentage wise in comparison to fat and carbs, the lower my weight became. To touch on the protein, I was nodding yes because there are studies that show that people who consume more protein usually are of a lower weight. This doesn't mean that protein burns fat. This means 
that what's likely happening is protein is much more satisfying. There's a higher thermal effect of food, which means how many calories you burn during digestion. In regard to protein, you're more likely to have more lean mass the more protein you consume, which will help keep your metabolism healthy, which makes it easier to maintain a healthy weight or lose weight. So there are a lot of reasons why eating more protein is beneficial for weight loss, but protein does not automatically burn fat. In regards to weight versus fat percent intake, the less fat I consumed, the lower my weight became. Okay, the fat thing, that's misleading. The reason that she's seeing that is because she went from keto to not keto, and she was consistently decreasing her calories over time. So it wasn't that the less fat you eat, the more you're gonna lose weight. It was that she transitioned from keto to not keto. Meanwhile, her calories were decreasing. In regards to weight versus carb percent intake, the more carbs I consumed, the lower my weight became. Same thing with the fat, she transitioned off of keto, went from eating very few carbs to more carbs while she's decreasing her calories. So I don't think that that data is relevant or helpful necessarily when put into context with how everything went. So there you have it guys. From the beginning, I said I was going to do this for me and I kept true to that. Unexpected challenges arose during my journey, but I kept going back to my why. I wanted to get in the best shape of my life mentally and physically. I feel so proud for completing my 90 days and completing it with total love and compassion for myself. That's amazing. I talk about whys all the time. It's like the very first thing we talk about in my course. Having a strong why is so important. So I think that's an amazing place to end the video because I know this is really long and I have a feeling she's just gonna do like a little outro. So overall, pretty good video. I will say that I know that Cassie has never claimed to be like a nutrition expert, at least I don't think. Again, I haven't seen a ton of her content, but I feel like I recall that when she like put out some program, maybe it was related to this, that she had a registered dietitian or like a nutritionist do the nutrition portion of it. So she outsourced that because that's not her area of expertise, which I love. So she really was just kind of like trying stuff and reporting on it, which I think is totally fine. As long as you make the proper disclaimers, although it is also up to the audience to realize like who they're getting information from and whether or not it's the right fit for them to also follow that plan or advice. So anyway, I know that was a really long video. I'm not gonna talk your ear off too much longer. Overall though, I think my impression was overall positive from this video from Cassie about her weight loss journey. I'm really bummed that she got so much hate from it, but let me know if there's any other content from her that you want me to check out, because again, I haven't seen a ton of it. But as usual, guys, thank you so much for watching my channel. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe here. You can also follow me on TikTok and on Instagram, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.